Hey, this is David Hayter. You may know me as the screenwriter of films like X-Men, X-Men 2, and Watchmen, but you probably know me best as the voice of Solid Snake from Metal Gear Solid. And you're listening to Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. Kept you waiting, huh? Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Hawaii's Number One Podcast, uh, Casanova. Ah, I messed it up completely. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what happens when you have a, a, a one month old and you're going off like two hours of sleep, and then oh, yeah, man. and then caffeine. Yeah, okay. Anyways, as I was supposed to say, welcome everyone to another episode of Hawaii's Number One Podcast, the Casanova Podcast. I'm your host, Mikael Casanova, and I'm honored today to have the one, the only. Steve Bowling of Good Vibes Gaming. Steve, how you doing today? Hey, man, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. It's such an honor to have you on the show, man. It, how's uh, how's this month going with gaming, man? There's so much going on. Wow. <laughs> uh, it is. It is I, I feel like the first half of 2021 seemed like it was going to be real slow, and now mm. I'm working on one, two, three. I'm I'm under embargo for <laughs> for three games right now. Of Ash has got one of his own. Derek's got two of his own, so so we're there's a lot of stuff popping off right now around around this month. So I feel like it's just gonna go upward from here. But yeah, we got a lot of interesting stuff in the works. Uh, I I can't wait till next week when I can talk about like eighty <laughs> percent of the things we're working on. But yeah, a lot of a lot of hush hush operations going on at GVG right now. Definitely, definitely, and that's one of the things um, that's so interesting with like people who. You know, who may who people may not know what it's like for us who work with companies and get embargoes and get game codes and products. Uh, there's a lot of things we can't say. Like if you ask us, "Oh, are you covering this?" Can't say. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> maybe I am. Maybe, maybe I'm not. <laughs> You'll just have to wait. But uh, it's uh, how do you um, how do you feel like um, between managing? Because I know you have children as well, but managing children work reviewing games leisure time like how do you juggle all that i'm, I'm yeah. struggling with this with a one month old yeah now. yeah it's it's definitely uh difficult right like i've got four kids i've got i i you know i don't just contribute to gvg but i help run gvg along mm-hmm. with ash and derek um and then you know i i do have to have a life outside of that right so i have to be mm-hmm. a father i have to i have to i have a nine to five on top of all that uh so oh, wow you know i um so it, it is kind of a struggle right like you got to find uh the time to do the things you love while keeping yourself healthy and that's that's the hard part right because it is real easy in this industry to go down the rabbit hole of just hey man i got you know i can sleep three hours and i'll i'll be cool like I'm, especially when you're a parent you know what i'm talking about like you're like oh whatever <laughs> like most nights i'm sleeping three hours so yeah i'm gonna i'm i can do this you know even if my kid's not up and i'll just power through uh, and you find out that that burns you out real hard real fast mm-hmm. so uh the key for us is you know we we set realistic expectations with our partners right i'll tell them like hey if you don't get me this game uh far enough in advance then i'm not going to be able to hit your embargo deadline and if you're still mm-hmm. cool with that i'll still talk about the game and i'll still cover it but just be aware you know we got a lot going on and it's you got to prioritize yourself first right you got to prioritize your mental health your well-being the things that matter to you, your family, the people close to you. And and then you got to make a room for the other things. And fortunately for me, I have, you know, a very supportive partner. She helps me out, you know, with, with the, with the kids and with the parenting workload and stuff like that. Um, but I have a hard and fast rule when I joined the industry because I joined the industry right as I was becoming a father for the mm-hmm. first time. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to be the dad who's like up during the day, playing video games, telling my kids like, Hey, be quiet. Daddy's working, you know, that kind of thing. I'm going to wait till they're in bed till I've had my time with them for the day to, so that they've had that parental attention and affection. And mm-hmm. then, and then I'll do this stuff and you know, if I, I'll make it fit. Um, but I'm not going to 
you know, center my life around this business that we're all in. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, for me, that's the right way to approach it. And I, I definitely get, you know, there's a lot of folks in this business that don't have partners that don't have children and <laughs> more power to you, man, that I wish I could have been doing it when I was younger. And when I when I didn't have the attachments that I have now. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's it, to me, yeah, it's just the most important thing to uh, to make sure that you uh, do it in a way that's conducive to your health and well-being. And if you can't do that, then you're not going to bring the right energy to the content you create. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, you know, definitely, like you said, it's about the balancing and, and prioritizing yourself because like right now, as of this week, as much as I can share, I'm covering like 10 different projects, uh, a couple wow. games and a couple things that are releasing this week. And I'm like, hmm, OK, that's that's a long game. Uh Okay. <laughs> like Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're we're fortunate in that, you know, I think I think you and I are probably covering a couple of the same things, right? Yeah. <laughs> like you always have to do that balancing act of like, okay, how much of this do I need to play to be able to talk about it in a competent way? Yeah. And and it's always tough when it's like a brand new game, never been released before, 40, 50 hours, you know. <laughs> um, you know, I always I people complain about remakes and re-releases and yeah. as somebody who covers content professionally i'm like thank god for remakes and re-releases right? <laughs> like, <laughs> if i if i already played this game and i know the story and i know how it ends i just need to know if this game runs better or worse i need to yeah. know if it looks better or worse and talk about those things because i know the rest i'm like thank you <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> so slide some of those in every month and i'll be okay yeah exactly like it's 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 interesting with how like I look at the way I look at gaming now like a game is 40 50 60 sometimes like if we're talking about persona games or it's you know say uh, atlas games uh 100 hours now I'm like that's an investment I, man I, I need at least a couple weeks to cover something like that whereas like when I was younger I'm like yeah give me those long games yep. just yeah that's that's the thing <laughs> if, if I was 19 years old and i was doing this and they were like hey here's an rpg it's 100 hours you got a week to beat it i'd be like done and done like I'm, right i'll be through with it in, in four days and i'll have three to make the video <laughs> i'm like now now i'm like yeah i need i need time i need a lot of time for this you need to you need to give me as much advance notice as you can on a game like yeah. that you know uh so it's, it is interesting you know like life gets more complicated as we get older, right? We have so many yeah. more things to do, so many more things to think about. And yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, difficult to get a game, like a really meaty big game with just a handful of days to cover it. Like, mm -hmm. do you sacrifice for the sake of getting the coverage out on time? Because unfortunately this is a business where timeliness is, is really important. Uh, yeah. You know, you have like a short window of opportunity to capitalize on a game's, uh, embargo lifting and, and get the coverage out while people are looking for it yeah um you know very few games are evergreen in terms of content very few games just generate views no matter when you put a video out like your yeah. minecraft your roblox the games i don't want to play <laughs> those are the ones <laughs> that generate you know just people will click on those videos all day um but if you put out like a you know, Final Fantasy VII Remake, oh, two weeks after it comes out, nobody's going to watch it. Everybody's already played it and, and moved yeah. on. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, I, I tend to, you know, before in the past, I would definitely prioritize uh, timeliness over over my mental health and well-being. And I think since mm -hmm. founding GVG with Ash and Derek, we've we've really realized that you can't center on that. Like, it's not sustainable to yeah. to burn the the uh, candle at both ends on that. You'll you'll just end up empty and, and yeah. you won't like the content you make you'll just resent what you were doing you're like yeah man i i hurt i'm tired i, <laughs> I didn't enjoy <laughs> doing this and people pick up on that your viewer picks up on on the lack of enthusiasm yeah uh and, and speaking of gvg i definitely want to dive into that you know you're a co-founder of good vibes games uh, previously of game explain you know you've been you've been in this industry across the board ign kotaku nintendo life the list goes on. <laughs> let's walk us through this. Like, let's step into to the, the DeLorean. Let's go back. Walk us through it. You know, spare no detail. <laughs> All right, man. Yeah. The So I mentioned earlier, uh, I joined 
or I got into games journalism when my first daughter, my, my eldest daughter was, uh, about to be born because mm -hmm. I had this fear. I was just like, Oh, you know, I'm not going to be able to play games anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm becoming a dad. I won't have time. I'm going to be devoted to the baby, you know, but what I can do is I can write, I can find time to write here and there. And I'll write about, you know, I'll write about my hobby instead of just abandoning it. Mm -hmm. And I, I started writing on Kotaku's community blog and, you know, I got like a few clicks here and there. People would talk to me on, on my articles. Like this was right around the time that the PlayStation four was about to launch. The Xbox mm -hmm. one was about to launch not that long ago. <laughs> but, um, I, I ended up like finding a way to get like some controllers early and doing, mm -hmm. doing like reveals of, of the controllers on my blog. And um, I live in Mesa, Arizona, which is not a, not a, what I would call a central hub for gaming. <laughs> but, um, I had discovered that there was a controller customization shop named Evil Controllers located near me in Tempe, which is about a 20 minute drive away. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, how can I get like new original stuff, you know, without going too far because I don't have any deals. I don't have brands talking to me. Nobody's giving me review codes. So I got to find my own angle. Mm -hmm. And so I reached out to this controller shop and I was like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm just getting started out. I'm writing about video games. Uh, I don't have a lot of readers or viewers or anything, but I'd love it if I could tour your facility and do like a how it's made for your controllers, for your products. Mm -hmm. And they were thrilled. They're like, yeah, man, you know, we're, <laughs> nobody pays attention to us. <laughs> like nobody comes out here. So they, they very generously let me in and, mm -hmm. you know, I brought my camera with me and I took a bunch of photos and, um, I, I wrote up an article just on the whole thing, like what the office was like, what the culture there was like, what, uh, how these controllers were made and what the, f and they sent me home with a couple samples, like my first free things I ever got. Right. And I was so <laughs> thrilled. I took a bunch of pictures of them and I did kind of like a, like an article with a gallery post attached mm -hmm. to it. And I thought, you know what, this is kind of cool. Like I should pitch this. And so, uh, at the time, uh, Tina Amini, who is now the, you know, editor in chief of IGN was the deputy editor of Kotaku. And I just sent her the article in a quick email. I was like, hey, Tina, big fan. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just a little dude out here in Tempe, like writing about video games. Uh, I thought you might like this, you know, if, if you, and because it was attached to Kotaku, it was their community blog. Uh, they could just re share over stuff that I wrote. And mm -hmm. so I was like, you know, in case you want to in, in case you want to share this with the larger Kotaku audience, you know, please feel free. And next next morning i woke up and it was on the front page of kotaku and people were, <laughs> were reading my article and telling me how cool it was and and they enjoyed it and they're like please write more i mm -hmm. didn't know kotaku hired this guy and i was like well they didn't hire me like <laughs> they just shared my <laughs> my personal article and uh you know that kind of lit a fire under me and i was like damn like people like what i'm doing mm -hmm. and so i'm just gonna keep doing it and i i started finding more and more uh unique stories to write about i started reviewing things that i bought like dlc and um, eventually I started getting, you know, Ubisoft approached me and said, Hey, would you like to actually review a game? And they sent mm -hmm. me over South Park, the stick of truth. And excellent game. <laughs> I, yeah, it's an excellent game. And I loved it. And I ended up, you know, doing just this in, insanely long review for it. I, I have like a notebook full of notes on the thing. And I, I published that and Kotaku wanted to share that. And so my mm -hmm. first ever review got shared over to Kotaku.com and, um, at that point, people started just proactively seeking me out and sending me codes for games and asking me to look at things. Um, and over the over like the next six months, I would just get most of my articles syndicated on Kotaku. Mm -hmm. um, they ended up. I, I remember Luke Plunkett, who's Kotaku's Australian correspondent, posted a gallery of like the most gorgeous PS1 games he had ever seen. It was from a NeoGaf post back when NeoGAF was a place to be <laughs> and uh i noticed that of all these screenshots one of mm -hmm. them was definitely not a playstation game i was like that's not a real playstation game that's fake and so i went to the NeoGAF thread and i found the screenshot in the thread but nobody knew what it was from and i did like mm -hmm. a reverse google image search and i found out it was from this indie racing game called drift stage and oh. drift stage was super cool looking it was like this vaporwave ps1 styled 80s uh retro themed racer mm -hmm. and i just fell in love with it i was like more people need to know about this and so i i ended up talking to the developers and interviewing them 
on again on my personal little nobody's looking blog <laughs> and <laughs> I, I titled it two guys are making the coolest racing game i've ever seen and i didn't even have to pitch this one like it just mm -hmm. appeared on kotaku.com the next morning and from there it blew up i mean it ended up getting you know people started taking my article and republishing it all over the internet i had uh, red bull esports was publishing my article all these other people wow. were taking my my article and then you know within two months of me doing that sony announces that they're going to uh help with a port of drift stage to the ps4 and the ps vita and i'm sitting there in the audience at this point because i got invited to e3 and i'm like I made that happen. Like I, <laughs> I helped these people get their game on on PS4, and unfortunately, the game, like many Kickstarter stories, like fizzled out, and never came yeah. out. But uh, just like the the world was enamored with this, and I was like, I can't believe you know that my writing can reach like these heights that people will will read something that I find interesting to this degree. Mm -hmm. So um, I ended up getting the courage to like reach out to Kotaku and say like, Hey, you know, you guys have syndicated a lot of my stuff. How about I just do an actual freelance piece, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and they, and so I wrote this article about, uh, street fighter three's parry mechanic and how much I loved it. And it did really well. It, it was surprising. You know, at that point I was, I, I was getting review copies on the regular, like I was reviewing lots of games. Kotaku was syndicating my reviews, like in a little, like they'd review a game and then they'd have like a little blurb at the bottom and say, check mm -hmm. out Steve Bowling's review down here. And I'm like, damn, <laughs> like I am, I'm not getting paid for any of it though. And so, you know, which is fine. That's, you know, it's not like we had this agreement and they chose not to pay me. I was just mm -hmm. writing my own thing. And I told them, you know, you guys can, whenever you want, please do like amplify my stuff. You, you have my ongoing permission forever and mm -hmm. i mean they used it which was an honor to me you know and somebody had been yeah. reading the site for a decade at that point um but i wanted to get more into you know do it a little more seriously at this point my daughter mm -hmm. had grown up a bit i'd been at this for a while and i felt like i had a good rhythm of being able to play games and balance it with being a father and uh, Nintendo Life was looking for reviewers. They were just like, hey, we need people to review games, you know, all this Wii U shovelware stuff. And <laughs> I, I, I was, you know, the one thing I wasn't covering was Nintendo stuff. I was playing mostly Xbox and PlayStation games. And so I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, you know what? I love Nintendo. I'll, I'll review some Nintendo stuff. And um, I had, they, they just started sending me codes. I published maybe 40, 50 reviews on the site. Um, mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, the Switch was on the horizon. And... I happen to have been invited to a press event for Nintendo, uh, and I, I met the basically the person that was handling all of PR for Nintendo at that point. Like they're external from uh, Golan Harris, the agency mm -hmm. they work with, and a uh, real cool guy used to work for IGN. His name is Rich. He's no longer there, so I feel comfortable, <laughs> you know. <talking laughs> about and, uh, and I had mentioned to him, I was like, "Hey, you know, I'm like the only U.S.-based guy at Nintendo Life that reviews stuff." could you send me a switch? Could you send me mm -hmm. a switch and send me, you know, breath of the wild. I'd, I'd love to be able to contribute to coverage. And he's like, wow. Yeah. All right. <laughs> you know, he's like, Nintendo <laughs> life has tons of viewers, tons of readers. And I reached out to, uh, Damien McFerrin and, uh, and Anthony Dickens who own the site. And I was like, Hey guys, I'm pretty sure I'm getting a free switch for review. Mm -hmm. And they're like, how'd you pull that off? And I was like, I was in the same room as the guy who controls the flow of these things. And I just asked <laughs> and they were like, all right, well, you know, we, we'll definitely have you on board for that. And they brought me on, on a more formal capacity and they made me mm -hmm. their U S editor uh, because I'd just been there for so long reviewing stuff. And I, I helped with the launch of the switch. I ended up creating guides for like breath of the wild and stuff like that. And I, I ended up very nearly becoming the uh, Nintendo life's dedicated guides editor. They wanted to pull me out of my nine to five Mm -hmm. and, and just hire me full time. But, you know, unfortunately, they were still kind of uh, at a point where they couldn't afford to offer me what I needed to support my family. And so right. I was like, you know, I appreciate the offer, guys, but I'll stick with, you know, doing it, doing it kind of freelance ish for now. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, I started to realize, like, hey, you know, people really like my guides. Like one of my one of my Breath of the Wild guides was the most viewed article in Nintendo Life's entire history. And so I was like, wow. all right, people like my my guides. You know, I, I write good <laughs> directions on how to do things. So uh, by this point, Tina had moved over to IGN and taken on her current role there. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to them and I was like, hey, guys, you know, do you need any help with freelance anything? I'm just trying to make a little extra holiday money. And 
I ended up doing a bunch of freelance guides for them. I, I did the Evil Within two, Destiny two. Uh, I did I did God, uh, Xenoblade Chronicles two. A lot of twos. <laughs> and so, um, it was it was interesting. I really enjoy all the work I've done for IGN. I also did a piece on uh, best Easter eggs in games, ten favorite mm-hmm. robot masters. I did an episode of a. Uh, of uh what show was it the review crew which got scrapped it never released unfortunately um but uh yeah it was definitely you know i think that i I kind of ping-ponged around the industry in a weird way and and landed Mm -hmm. where i'm at now uh game explain picked me up after i started doing all this freelance stuff because uh at nintendo life i wanted to join their video team but at the Mm -hmm. time Uh, Nintendo Life only had like a UK based video crew. And so they were like, yeah, we don't, we're not really set up to do that in America right now. You know, Mm -hmm. you'd, you'd be on your own. And I admittedly knew nothing of the craft of making video game video content. Like I didn't own a camera. I didn't own a microphone. I was just like, yeah, I'd really like to do this. Um, And they were like, you know, maybe, maybe no. (laughs) So I was like, all right, that's that's fair. I appreciate it. They hired Zeon, who is an incredible talent. And, you know, I wish him all the best. He's doing great over there. And he clearly has like a wealth of knowledge when it comes to making content. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, I had been becoming closer with Andre and the folks at Game Explain because Mm -hmm. we ran in the same circles, right? Like we, you know, we would compete for who would get the earliest appointment slot for Nintendo at a show or mm-hmm. or who would get the better coverage, you know. And I eventually, because I couldn't, uh, I mean, just the logistics of, like, sending video over to the guys in the UK and having them edit it and having them make a video, it would sometimes take days or weeks. And they would often just be like, ah, you know, forget it. We'll go to our own events and capture our own video. So I would supply Game Explain with video that I captured while I was mm-hmm. on the road because I was like, hey, guys, you know, I here's here's my gameplay demo stuff i usually because for whatever reason at the time nintendo would very often give me more favorable time slots than they would give game explain so i would Mm -hmm. have footage two or three hours before they would even get to play the game and so you know we we had become friends and i would just send over my video footage to them and say hey if you guys want to use this and you can get a video out before your meeting even happens there you go and they would sometimes do it sometimes not but at that point andre was like hey why don't you just come over here if you want to learn how to do videos and we'll teach you the craft and you can just work with us and i mean i think that you know the history there unfortunately is fairly well documented yeah (laughs) beyond a certain point uh things things were not as uh things didn't go the way i wanted them to (laughs) and uh you know ash derek and i decided that we wanted to have our creative freedom we wanted to do this type of work but in a in a more healthy uh, a way that's conducive to living well right Mm -hmm. mm-hmm uh, so we decided to found Good Vibes Gaming. We were we were all kind of of the same mind that we wanted to keep doing this, but we wanted to do it in a way that was good for us mm-hmm. as well as good for our audience. And uh, so far, we're you know really happy with the initial success we've had. We still feel like we're very much in the infancy of this channel, um, but we got but a lot doing, of plans. But you're doing phenomenally well. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, it, it's hard though when you when you come from a channel that you know their 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 sub count is in the seven digits, and you're like, well, uh, I'm I'm not doing that good. <laughs> or I'm sorry, like the nine digits. You know, it's just it's it's a very different thing. So, we're yeah. we're we're grateful to be where we are, but we obviously have a, have in our view a long road ahead. Yeah, it's it's always difficult, like just starting over, but. The beauty of that is, you know, it's 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 a new genesis. Like w- when you guys started Good Vibe Ga- Good Vibes Gaming, I remember when that started, and you know, I remember subbing to the channel and watching just the growth of it, and the style and the format and the flow of the three of you, and it's just, it's amazing. You guys mesh so well, and the way you guys come together and and flow off of each other i never would have expected that from you know (laughs) (laughs) well well, thank you thank yeah i i think that you know we didn't necessarily expect it either we kind of uh we we had a stream where for whatever reason the three of us and we very seldom even at gx you know it was very seldom was it just the three of us but we had a stream Mm -hmm. together and we were like maybe 20 minutes early by mistake for the uh, for the portion we wanted to watch. It was an Age of Calamity stream, mm-hmm. and they they were like showing off some some poor cosplay models, but like on the stream, and we <laughs> and the three of us were talking, and we're just like, 
man, like the best part of the stream was us all feeling really weirded out by this, by the way they were ogling this model on, on camera. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I would, I would say that game explain, you know, they, um, no, no offense to the current crew. Of course. I think that mm -hmm. Andre did manage to hire some incredibly talented, gifted people. And I, I'm very, uh, hopeful that they're having a great time over there. Um, but I, w I would say that the chemistry in discussions, especially the larger the group becomes, is very hard to maintain. Yeah. I, and we're just lucky that, you know, the three of us are kind of so on the same page when it yeah. comes to a lot of things. So it, it's easy for us to kind of vibe off each other when we're when, when we're in the middle of a, of a live stream and, and we don't really have anything rehearsed or planned or pre-recorded. I think we work best that way. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, with uh, helping run uh, Good Vibes Gaming weekly like daily tell us about some of the things that you do on daily for uh gvg like how do you uh, between managing that and and full-time job and everything as well yeah, uh, yeah what are some of the things that you you know that you can share oh yeah yeah so um i i run the the show like in terms of tnt uh from from my desk here so okay. uh what you're seeing on screen what your you know transitions all that i'm i'm behind the stream deck here <laughs> moving, <laughs> moving the show along as it were um you know ash takes care of gathering the news for every episode Derek mm -hmm. takes care of scheduling the stream and making the patreon posts um i handle a lot of the business end of gvg so working with okay. publishers working with brands uh, you know, making sure that the trains are running on time in terms of we're getting our AdSense revenue, our Patreon revenue, and uh, mm -hmm. working with our artists and designers to, to make sure uh, merch looks right, make sure that, you know, any any new assets we're working on, I, I'm i kind of the one moving those things forward. So I, right, I tend to work right. a lot more with, with uh, engaging with third parties to make sure that, that our priorities are getting moved up. And uh, that that can be difficult, like because sometimes even I forget. I'm like, man, where the hell were we at with you know, the logo <laughs> for the new show, or where are we at with the Patreon video we're supposed to be producing? And and fortunately, Derek and Ash, you know, they'll they'll have my back on that, and occasionally they'll be like, hey, Steve, did you remember to to go back to the artist and, and approve that design, or mm -hmm. have you ordered samples for the shirts yet? So a lot of the dollars and cents stuff is is mostly what I deal with. Um, but I do enjoy, you know, publisher relations is probably my primary thing, right? Because you got to have access to stuff in order to create yeah. content. And, um, you know, a, lo a lot of those deals are closed on my end. Uh, we have some some outliers, like Derek works, works with Sega because he has a great relationship there. Mm -hmm. uh, Ash has a really good relationship with Square, so he helps us out with that. Um, but by and large, a lot of that stuff filters through me, and I'll, I'll make sure we get review codes for stuff and dole them out to the appropriate folks as needed and i'll make sure that you know anybody that from the outside that works with us on works with us on stuff i'll process those invoices make sure they get paid on time it's a lot of stuff you don't think about i do a lot of the unglamorous <laughs> part of of content creation <laughs> well and, and that's the thing is like a lot of people like I, i've had a couple uh blah uh, see, see, I said two hours of sleep catching up. No worries. Uh, I've actually been having a lot of conversations uh, recently with people, um, especially out here in Hawaii, that are, I guess, becoming more curious about content creating, uh, you know, when it comes to, like, video game journalism, uh, doing YouTube videos, live streams, and whatnot. And the common misconception is, like, oh, you just – you know, hitting record or you're hitting go live or, you know, you're just playing a game. And a lot of people don't understand that there's like that's probably the one percent of everything else that you're yep. doing. The behind the scenes, you know, business negotiations, making sure you have your your partnerships, your brand endorsements, you know, your Patreon stuff. You know, if you got coffee or literally coffee and coffee the website <laughs> yeah. uh, you know um you know making sure you're taking care of um you know if you got a discord because running a discord can be very very taxing and draining uh, make sure you have your equipment for everything you're doing it's there's a lot that goes into it and i don't think it's one of the things like with, with this show like i really try to bring focused to that because i want people to understand that it's not as simple as you think <laughs> yeah it, it definitely isn't i mean you know you you mention a really good point about equipment like my setup has evolved and is constantly evolving over time mm -hmm. right um i started out with no camera 
with a $99 mic, uh, no stream deck, uh, running off a of Microsoft Surface, you know, uh, like, like <laughs> the jankiest setup you could find, um, you know, recording in my closet because it was the only place with good enough acoustics, right? Mm. Um, and, and that's another thing, like, people don't consider, you know, you have to have especially for content creation you have to have decent audio gear decent video gear and, and yep. that doesn't necessarily mean you have to go out and buy an sm7b or a gh5 or a four thousand dollar pc you know mm -hmm. you can do it with with uh, lower lower end stuff but you have to take into consideration a lot of those things a lot of those aspects right um because my my initial recordings sounded awful and like i listened back to them i'm like <laughs> i don't know how anybody watched these but um, and i feel bad for those folks but at the same time uh you know like you said there's so many other things that's just one piece of a much larger puzzle uh you know we have a discord i'm grateful to our team of dedicated mods who who help us keep things tidy uh, who, mm -hmm. who keep me from having to put out fires constantly but even beyond that when you grow to have a platform and your community begins to scale you, you those people reach out to you you know and and any good person that that is managing a large community of folks is gonna have to, like you don't you don't get where you want to be by ignoring your audience right you don't get where right. you're gonna be by just oh well that's a dm from the audience i'm gonna leave that on <laughs> unread, you know? um you you have to engage with the people that are supporting you um because right. you have to show support back to the people that are that are giving you their support and um that that alone it could be a full-time job unto itself you know the mm -hmm. bigger you grow i mean y you know that that number that 60 66 000 number is 66 000 human beings mm -hmm. like that are that are watching <laughs> your stuff that are that are that are interested enough in you to click subscribe and at any point any one of them can decide you know what i want to ask mikhail a question I'm gonna I'm gonna DM him on Twitter and see see what his thoughts are on this because they care they care about you they care about your opinions that's what yeah. they're there for, and that alone is is a huge uh, commitment to make, uh, you know not again alongside other things external to content creation but I I think that the the best advice I can give someone who wants to do it is just get started like don't mm -hmm. question yourself do not like I mean accept that your very first outings will not be your greatest work. They're not going to be the things like you look back on fondly and go, man, I, I slammed it out of the park here. Great job, me. Like, you're going to look <laughs> back on those in a year or six months or 30 days even, depending, and just say, wow, I can't believe I put that out. I would never do that today. Because I look at my first videos and I'm like, I didn't emote enough. My voice didn't sound natural. I was mm -hmm. nervous. I can hear it. And I'm like, I would never today i would never accept that video but back then it was my first effort and i was like you know what at least i got out and i did it and mm -hmm. i think that if you muster up that courage to get out and do the thing you will and, and you will reach <clears throat> a point some point down the line where you're comfortable enough to sit back analyze and determine how you can improve as long as you're always willing to accept that there's room for improvement you'll you'll end up doing well yeah so so you know to to uh to piggyback off of that i um one of the things like with in my discord i've had uh content creators that are interested in like working with companies and with reviewing games and i've actually had several of them they're thinking like okay i'm just gonna go to capcom or sony or nintendo and they're gonna immediately work with me and you know not to <laughs> discourage them but to discourage him in the same way, um, I tell them you have to build towards that. Like you need to have a body of work, a portfolio of work. If you have games already, start reviewing what you have. If you have controllers, accessories, whatever, start reviewing it. You need to start building. That way companies can look at your work when you – reach out to them or if they happen to stumble across you they'd be like oh okay so they've done this 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 okay okay so we get a sense of their style um i know for myself you know i've been doing independent game journalism for five and a half almost six years and i literally started with just reviewing my own stuff you know and 
I never, never, never thought that would become a full-time career. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just something I just started doing. And over time, I went from working with, you know, from just reviewing my own stuff to working with indie dev, uh, devs and, and uh, accessory companies and now computer companies and, and what's it, uh, Trend Micro? I never thought <laughs> Trend oh, <wow>. Micro. <laughs> I'm, I'm partnered with them, uh, you know, doing stuff with AAA developers now. It is, it's a gradual process, but it's always been in my mind to just build a portfolio of work. And I think that just usually comes from, well, at least for me, I think it comes from having worked at 9 5, uh, working in IT, where you, if you wanted this job, okay, can you do it? Do you have proof or body of work? So that's always kind of just been my approach. But what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, if- uh, I, I largely agree with everything you said. Um, so when I set out, I, I kind of knew that, you know, I'm not going to get Nintendo or Sony or Microsoft. Mm-hmm. They're, they're going to be like, yo, you're uh-uh. <laughs> <Not today." laughs> and so I, I realized that the best way forward was probably to work together with smaller devs, indie devs, you know, people. Because mm-hmm. I want you to imagine for a moment, listener or viewer, mm-hmm. is this video or is this audio only? No, oh, it'll be both. It'll okay, be both. perfect. So viewer or listener, I want you to imagine for a moment, uh, like kind of, your, your own following, right? Mm-hmm. And then I want you to imagine the following of the person you're asking to give you something for free. So if you're by yourself and they, you, you talk to someone with, with let's just say, 10,000 fans, and you say, hey, I want to promote your thing, they're going to look behind them and say, I don't really need you. <laughs> you know, I, 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 you, it doesn't look like you have more people than I do. Um, mm-hmm. And the biggest advice I can give you is just, you know, and, and that's not the only thing that factors in, but it's a very good binary way to probably decide, have you made it far enough to expect, and, and you should never expect, but expect to right. get a good response, right? Um, the other The other tip, the primary tip I can give you, and this is, Honestly, in this business, the number one most important thing that a lot of people surprisingly don't get is remember that whoever it is you're emailing is a person just like you with feelings and shit going on in their life. Mm -hmm. And the last thing they need is you getting angry with them because they're not giving you something for free. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and you have to be willing to accept both no and the absence of a response, right? A lot mm-hmm. of these folks get so many thousands of emails a day that they're just like, well, if I'm not going to say yes, I'm just not going to answer. <laughs> and <laughs> I have I have learned over the years to accept like, man, if they go silent on me, it's probably is I'm not going to get the answer I want. And and right. pressing them further is not going to get me the answer I want. Um you know, I, I've had a friend, I won't name names here, but mm-hmm. uh, he was very excited to get his hands on Smash for the Wii U. Nintendo mm-hmm. had sent him some stuff in the past, right? Um, and if you've ever worked with Nintendo, you know that they can be kind of mercurial. Like, you might get yeah. one game, but you might not get another game. And so they are going to, uh, you know, he had just been pressing, like, hey, I want Smash. Hey, I want Smash every day, sending an email. And he eventually asked me because he knew I had a lot of partnerships with a lot of other companies. And I, I was blown away. I was like, I can't believe you've emailed every day. I was like, I, that is not a thing I would have ever done. I was like, you send one and maybe follow up in a couple weeks if you haven't heard yeah. back. And that is it. And yeah. they, he eventually got a response back and they were like, nope and don't ever ask for another game again because you're not going to get it and i was just like you just burned a bridge man you you had a bridge with a huge huge manufacturer of games and you just lost it um and i've always 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 taken that to heart because i can tell you every pr person that you talk to if they're willing to be candid with you will say i always remember the ones that are rude (laughs) like Mm -hmm. you don't forget and and that's just human nature right if someone is rude to me i'm not i'm gonna remember that i'm gonna remember that for way longer than than most other interactions so you know conversely people remember if you're kind like if somebody says hey i can't get you this and i i hear that i hear that every every so you know every so often like hey i'd love to get you this game but i don't have codes available I can't send you a copy and I'm just like, cool, fine. You know, I'll buy it and cover it. It's cool. Mm -hmm. You know, and they, they always appreciate that. I'll follow up with the review of the game I bought and say, Hey, just so you know, 
we we followed through we bought the game we reviewed it we loved it we didn't like it whatever uh just so you can you know let let folks know that that we still covered your your game and Mm -hmm. you know nine times out of ten i get like a hey thanks a lot for doing that you didn't need to do that we appreciate it you know they remember that though when you come asking the next time yeah and you say hey can i can i get something and you know they might say you know what this guy wasn't an asshole like he was actually pretty pretty cool about the last time I turned him down. So this time I'm going to throw him a bone. Yeah. Uh, Cause in at the end of the day, like it's not a robot or an algorithm deciding if you get these copies. It is a very human decision. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say, you know, just remember, be humble, start small. Don't don't shoot for the moon on your first try. Like if you want to get something, and like like you said, review the stuff you got. Like that's I don't know anybody in this business who didn't review things they bought starting out. I don't know anybody who just start out the gate getting free stuff. So, you know, I my first review was an Xbox One controller that I picked mm-hmm. up at Walmart. And I was just like, oh, <laughs> this thing feels nice. Don't have a console to play it on, but it looks dope. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and that's just how it's going to be for 99.9% of people. Unless you get hired right into IGN out of college mm-hmm. or something, you're, you're going to be reviewing stuff that you picked up or you're not going to be reviewing anything. Yeah. And, and, you know, to again, to add to that, one thing I qu- I quickly learned once I started working with a lot of the video game company and, and tech company PRs is it's a very large group of people, but it's also very small. So yep. you piss off one, everybody knows. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's worth mentioning that <laughs> You know, you're going to if, if you really get into this business, you're dealing with a handful of agencies, right? Like, right. Most of the people you talk to work at one of the big like four agencies in this mm-hmm. business. And even if they don't, they all talk. Yeah. <laughs> they all, they you know, they're going to say like, oh, man, Steve Bowling from Good Vibes Gaming is such a jerk. Like, I I can't believe this guy. And then suddenly the people from, you know, repping Nintendo and Capcom and Sony and all of them are going to know. They're going to be like, yeah, stay away from him. He sucks. Yeah. So it, it's a small world. It is a very small world. And I recommend highly that you treat the people that are helping you create the content you want with respect and dignity because there, there's no coming back from that if you get a rep for, for being the other kind of guy. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I, I, again, adding on to that, like some of the things like so are, uh other up and coming YouTubers that previously I've worked with before, um, they had this stance of, oh, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna trash this game. I'm gonna say it's shit or sis, you know, I'm just gonna be quote unquote real. And I'm like, you can dislike something and say that you don't like it in a very respectful way, without being. Well, this is where I'm looking for. It's not controversial. Um, without being polarizing. Yeah. Because. Um, you know perceptions pretty much everything so you know there are certain games that have come out um you know case in point like minecraft i don't care for minecraft but i will never say that it's the worst game under the sun or it's absolute dog crap because it's it's very popular it's not for me and it's one of the things um you know if there, there are games that i review if if it seems like i would like it and then i get it and i don't like it I always make it a point in my review to say, hey, you might like this, but it's not for me. Just to be yeah. fair. <clears throat> and, and that's a really good way to look at it. There's there's, there's no such thing as an objective opinion, right? Mm-hmm. So you, you can come into a game. I played Little Town Hero. I hate that game. I hate mm-hmm. that game. I reviewed that game because I looked at it and I thought it would be amazing. And I played it and it absolutely disappointed me in Mm -hmm. almost every which way um but you know instead of approaching it like man this game sucks it's so terrible don't play this i i just laid out factually what the game was Mm -hmm. and then gave my opinion like here's the things that don't work for me like i don't like the randomness in the battle i don't like the animations you know i don't like the fact that that the environment is so small or there's not a lot of music in this game Mm -hmm. and for some people they still saw that review and was like whatever I still like this game and I'm cool with that. (laughs) You know, I don't need to come in and present my opinion as fact. And I think that that is what a lot of people miss out on. You know, when 
I get that YouTube, that the algorithm in some ways <clears throat> rewards negativity in your content yeah. because a lot of people click on negative stuff because they want to hear you wild out about something and, and talk about how terrible something is and trash it real hard. I get that people click on that, but mm -hmm. I, it's not, I, I think it stops being a review past a certain point and it's just you just shouting, shouting, you know, to try to grab attention and that style of content works for some people. It's not for me, and it's not yeah. something that... It's not a review that I would put stock in if I were to watch it. Right, right. So, uh, considering, like, where you're located and where I'm located, neither place is, you know, Arizona or Hawaii is, well, for lack of a better word, really centralized in gaming, you know, like yeah. the gaming culture and whatnot. How is it uh, for you being you know in the games industry in the place that's not really known for that like is it more difficult being able to work with organize like different game companies and tech companies or is it more easy i'm finding for myself it's challenging and easy because one since there's not really a lot of people here in hawaii doing it there's really no competition in many ways. And then there's also the backdrop of Hawaii. So companies say, Ooh, yeah, you're in Hawaii. I, you know, I want to do something there. Um, nice. but yeah, what, what are your thoughts? Um, so I would say in the day and age, wherein where a lot of content comes in digitally that mm -hmm. we're, that it's not too bad. Right. Like I, I got a code for, for a game that I can't talk about yet today and right. it's already <laughs> installed. I'm, I'm working on it. Um, so I would say in that regard, things are pretty easy. When I first joined the industry, there were still a lot of physical mailers going out. like, mm -hmm. and, and people would um, – there, there used to also be in-person preview and review events. And that was mm -hmm. hard, right? Because I could barely ever make those. Um, you know, Because people would hit me up and be like, hey, Steve, we want you to come out, try our game. We'll give you a copy to take home on the way out the door. And then I would say, oh, that's cool. I'm in Arizona. Are you, you know, do you want to fly me out? Are you expecting mm -hmm. me, you know, how, how am I getting there? And then I'd get like, oh, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you mean you're not here. And I would be like, yeah, you know, I, and then I'd get like, oh, we'll see if it's in the budget to fly someone out because we'd love mm -hmm. to have you. And then, you know, a day later I hear like, oh, sorry, we can't do it. We'll mail you a copy of the game later or something. I'm like, all right, cool. You know, and then <laughs> half the time the game would come, the other half I'd just never hear from them again. And, um, but, it, you know, in the current climate with things the way they are, that, that ain't happening. <laughs> so right, right. people people don't care as much that I'm from Arizona now. Um, but I would say that by and large it doesn't really have a huge effect because if people want me out there for something – big at this point and I, I hate to refer to myself this way but you know my relationship with a lot of these folks is established they i'm a known mm -hmm. quantity to a lot of folks now and so they kind of know like oh hey if steve's gonna come we got to make sure we can get him out here right. or you know we got to communicate to him that that we would like for him to travel because there are some companies that are like hey if you can drive out cool and and i've done that before like oh mm -hmm. your events in la that's five six hours i'll i'll just drive it's cool um, if it's something that is that important to the channel or, or you know, to me personally. Mm -hmm. um, but I've had Nintendo, you know, fly me out to New York for, for the World Championships. Or they've had, you know, in the past before COVID, they had preview events and stuff like that. And they would, mm -hmm. they would know that, hey, if we're going to offer Steve, he needs travel. And a lot of folks have been very accommodating of that fact. But I do feel like it is at least a bit different because... Um, you know, I have a lot of friends that are in the industry, like in, in more traditional roles, like Imran mm -hmm. Khan is a good friend of mine. Tina Amini is a good friend of mine. And a lot of those folks live in the Bay Area or L.A., mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's just like, <laughs> oh, hey, well, if I lose my job at GameSpot, IGN's six blocks down the road and I'll mm -hmm. just go apply there. And, you know, these people kind of know each other because they see each other and they run in the same actual physical social circles. And so, uh, you know, there there is kind of a sense of, you're not thought of as much because you're not there in the primary mm -hmm. location where these things are occurring. Um, but at the same time, I think that being decentralized is a huge benefit in the sense that it makes this profession much more accessible because right. the Bay Area, God, <laughs> it's expensive. <laughs> um, making a living wage doing this is, is very difficult there. Yeah. Um, whereas here, you know, Houses cost about a fifth as much, and so it's, it's, it's a lot easier to uh, be a family man and still do stuff like this while, you know, without needing to make 
six hundred thousand dollars a year or something crazy. Yeah. I mean, Oof. not saying the folks in the Bay Area make that much. Not even close. Game journalists <laughs> are still not paid. Uh, you know, they're not paid rock star salaries. They they deserve more than they get, um, but they definitely get more than uh, than I. You know, they they. I would say that they live. Uh, I don't want to say uncomfortably. I don't want to paint game journalists as impoverished people, but mm -hmm. I do. I, I think that they, the ones that live in the Bay Area, don't live as well as the ones that move away. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can I can definitely see that. Like when I went to, I want to say for E three twenty nineteen when PDP fl flew me out there, which again blew my mind because I was like, I'm a small creator. I. Like, I would never have expected that. But uh, when I went out there and I got to, you know, travel and meet a lot of my friends that are in the industry, because it's, it's so different, you know, getting to see people face to face. You've been emailing for years. Like, hey, yep. here's a code. Here's this. Here's that. How you doing? You know, would you like to cover this? And then being able to go out there and then, you know, go to E3, which I wish people told me to not wear dress shoes, to wear like. Oh, know. yeah. <laughs> Sneakers, man. <sighs> okay. We gotta talk about that. So when I w when I was asking around to prep for E three twenty nineteen, I was like, okay, what should I prepare? Because you know, my wife and I, my wife's also a content creator, and uh, she covers games and tech and anime and stuff like that. So we were both flown out there, and we were like, you know, what should we what should we we bring? They're like, oh, you know, business or business casual, and I'm like, okay, so where should we stay? So we got put up at a hotel by LAX, and they're like, yeah, yeah, you'll easily get to the convention center super quickly. We're like, are you sure? And then that was an hour, hour and a half. Yep. No one told us that. And then, you know, you had to get there early. It was it by 9, 930 to get your, your media badge. So we, we got there early and then didn't realize how... <laughs> Oh yeah, it was. And, you know, I'm walking around with loafers on. She's got her high heels on. No one told us. Oh to my god. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. But um, you know, I'm saying all this to say, like, uh, you know, with conventions coming back, um, I think there should be, like, if you're gonna anyone listening, if you're gonna go to a convention, say, if we ever have a physical E3 again, or you're going to PAX. Wear sneakers and comfortable clothes. Yes. And have <laughs> snacks. <laughs> yep. You need to have snacks. Oh my snacks, God. sneakers, comfy clothes, preferably something breathable, trust me. Yes. Um, water. Have water yes. handy. You're you're gonna need it. You're you think that walking between those halls isn't a big deal, but when you're when you're on your forty fifth lap for yeah. the day, you you feel it in every bone in your body. Yes, yes, you do. Um, would you also say business cards are important too? Because oh, one hundred percent. Okay, I think I I credit a lot of my growth in the industry to the fact that I bring about three hundred business cards to every convention I go to, and mm -hmm. I try to leave with none. Like, I will introduce myself to literally anybody with anything of interest. And just say, hey, here's my email. Please add me to your PR list. You know, mm -hmm. when you get back, if I could get yours, I, I come home, try to try to have a one to one relationship with cards I give out to cards I get, mm -hmm. and I will, you know, make notes on like this person had this, this person had this, this is what I was interested in, and I mm -hmm. will follow up with as many people as I can possibly remember to, and just say, hey, good meeting you at E3 or PAX or whatever. I really enjoyed this thing you showed me. I would love to talk more about it when you're ready. Uh, just please don't, you know, please uh, add me to whatever press release list you got. Send me over any assets you have. I am going to be talking about whatever you showed at the show. Mm -hmm. uh, so the more more stuff you give me back, the better I can make the content about your products. And that helps out immensely because I will get emails six, seven months down the line after a show and say, hey, that, that thing I showed you is ready to go. Do you still mm -hmm. want to cover it? And I'll hell yeah <laughs> so um you know a lot of a lot of my early opportunities came from just handing out business cards man you should always 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 have a stack of business cards with you all right right definitely definitely um so i know this is recent news uh as of this recording but uh with sony reversing their stance on uh 
you know, PSP, Vita, and PS3 games. I'm, I, I, I almost panic bought a bunch of games, <laughs> but something told me to wait, and then I. It, I think this is a great example of when gamers are very vocal about what they don't like because that, whew, I was like, man, I, I need a mortgage to, to pay for everything I want. Okay, let me get this, <laughs> let me get that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad that Sony changed their stance on it. And it, it really brings about the conversation of, you know, video game preservation because we're inching ever so closely and rapidly to a pure digital front and it's it kind of scares me because once a lot of these games go off the servers that's it (laughs) yep uh what needs to happen and and this is something i talked about on tnt Mm -hmm. last night um we need to get to the point where where the the storefront is decoupled from the hardware platform Yes. So the P- the PlayStation Store needs to just be something that exists outside of the PlayStation 5 at this point, right? It needs to – they need to take everything they've made available on PS3, PS4, PS5, PS Vita, mm-hmm. even PSP, and, and just keep those available for people. Because people will not pirate if you give them a legal, easy way to obtain the games they want. Mm-hmm. And – the, the way to allay these concerns about our digital games going away is to just not make them go away. <laughs> Which, yeah. And, you know, I get people will say, like, oh, that's hard, whatever, but these are companies with billions of dollars with, for all intents and purposes, infinite resources to, mm-hmm. to make something like this happen. They could easily hire a team of very skilled, very talented people and say, look, we need to get all the stuff from the PS3 and the PS4 stores onto what is currently the ps5 store and then make that the store going forward you know i made the example with steam you know Mm -hmm. i've owned dozens of pcs over my lifetime and i still have all my digital purchases because they were all (laughs) bought on steam and steam persists regardless of what hardware i have Mm -hmm. um and sony and microsoft absolutely can do that and they just haven't had the motivation to so i hope I hope that this is kind of an inflection point for Sony. And they say, wow, people really do want this old content. We need to make sure it's available Mm -hmm. so that people can buy it without pirating it. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm against piracy. I'm very vocally against piracy, but I also understand that if there's literally no other way to get the game legally, Mm -hmm. what, what do you expect people to do? Once you take away all the options, there's, there's not anything they can do if they, want to experience this game and i get that gaming is a hobby you're not gonna die without it but it is at the same point it's unreasonable to expect people not to download a game that is not available through some other means or you know physical copies of which are 700 dollars or something ridiculous i'm not gonna go buy a new copy of chrono trigger i'm glad i own it but i'm just saying if somebody born in 2010 wants Mm -hmm. to play chrono trigger I'm not going to tell them they need to go get 700 bucks and go buy it off eBay. I would, I would not be- begrudge them downloading the game. I mean, they could mm-hmm. get it on Steam though, but that's a, right. <laughs> a whole other point. It, it, it's, um, I mean, Steam is the the great example of, like you said, no matter what your hardware, what you paid for is there. And I, you know, you look at, excuse Nintendo as an example going from the digital storefront on the Wii to the Wii U to the Switch, or more so Wii to Wii U, where you had to, whatever game, say you bought some SNES games or Sega Genesis game or whatever, classic gaming on the virtual console on the Wii, you had to go and rebuy it on the Wii U. And then, you know, it's like, why is there not a... But again, this is Nintendo. But <laughs> 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 like, why is there not a unified brand? Like, and I really don't understand. I I love Nintendo, and they frustrate me at the same time because why? Why are we still three generations behind everyone else when it comes to network and inter- you know network interface, online services, online store? 
Why is the 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 e shop? Why is there so much shovelware? Oh yeah, just, N- just... Nintendo's Nintendo's online storefront is a mess. Uh, there's no two ways about it. I've played a lot of the shovelware on <laughs> Nintendo's various e shops, um, and I just can't understand. Uh, you know, they, they were able to code a system, and, and this is really important from a programming perspective, because people are mm-hmm. like, oh, Nintendo's behind the times, you have to rebuy your games because they just, you know, for whatever reason, the shop isn't built that way. That's not true. It's mm-hmm. absolutely not true, because they coded a function to detect if you had purchased a game and give you a discount. So, when you mm-hmm. move from Wii to Wii U, they're like, oh, you already bought Mario 64, we're going to knock it down to five bucks, which means they know your purchase history from the Wii, which means mm. they could have made it free. <laughs> but uh, people seem to gloss over that fact. And I think mm-hmm. that Nintendo needs to get with the time. So you need to start uh, respecting their players a bit more. And and that's mm-hmm. unfortunate to have to say, because Nintendo is my absolute favorite company in the biz. But the fact of the matter is they do not, uh, you know, they don't seem to want people to play anything beyond SNES right now on the Switch, which is just crazy. And then they just sold us Mario 64 along with Galaxy and, and uh, Sunshine for 60 bucks with minimal changes. Mm-hmm. And I have, I have not recovered from that yet. <laughs> and, and we got, you know, games like Fire Emblem popping up. It's five bucks, but it's still, I mean, come on. It just <laughs> roll out the program all the way or don't do it at all, but pick a lane and just stay in it. And yeah. I feel like Nintendo can't decide whether they want to give us access to all that cool stuff they had on the Wii or if they just don't want us to, but they... I don't know. I, the waffling approach to it is what gets me. I, I, I would love to see this stuff on NSO for free along with your subscription. You know, PlayStation has the PS uh, Plus collection. We've got Game Pass from Microsoft. We need mm-hmm. something equivalent from Nintendo, something that is more than just a smattering of, of old games. Yeah. And, and I, I feel like they could easily double the cost of their sub price if they just opened the floodgates to a bunch of NES and through to let's just say we content yeah yeah i would pay i I would easily pay a hundred bucks a year to get just a full-on virtual console experience that is included in my sub and that that's a lot more than than either the other two are charging yeah i mean look at all the games that nintendo has published themselves that the only way you can play it again is if you go back and own the original hardware and the original game, such as what Fire Emblem, um, Radiant Dawn, Path of Radiance, uh, yep. F Zero GX, uh, Star Fox Assault Adventures, like Wave Race, Blue Storm, original Wave Race, like uh, 1080 snowboarding. There's so many games, and it just really makes no sense because there's so much money left on the table that Nintendo could just be making. Yeah. I, and they're I, just not. <laughs> it, it is very perplexing to me the fact that we cannot get some of these games off of their original hardware. I, I, Nintendo has to know people would pay good money for this, and I, I still yeah. wonder why we haven't got at least an N sixty four classic. I mean, yeah. the hardware is available and cheap, so they mm-hmm. just need to. Need, I maybe maybe when Switch sales slow down a bit, they'll get desperate and <laughs> release something. <laughs> So, so what do you think of uh, the current rumors of a quote unquote Switch Pro? Uh, I I firmly believe that they're true. Um, I have, you know, I'm I'm an IT person like yourself, mm-hmm. uh, so you know I know how to validate a thing or two about a thing or two, mm-hmm. and I have, you know, the the code references to Aula or Aula, however you pronounce that, A U L A, are they're legit? They're mm-hmm. they're in the firmware. Um, the Bluetooth audio stuff is absolutely in the firmware. The upgradable dock firmware is there. Um, you know, references to a new screen part are there. Uh, so it, it's really just a matter of time. And mm-hmm. I feel like Nintendo is is smartly, you know, kind of keeping this back for, for the time being because, as we just alluded to, the Switch hasn't slowed down. And, right. you know, why sell people something new if the old thing is still selling very, very well? Um, right. But I think they are starting to see the upper limits of what this, the current iteration of the Switch can do, right? I mean, we've bumped up against them in Breath of the Wild. Um, you know, Mario Odyssey had to scale back at times to, like, 540p. Xenoblade Chronicles looked terrible in docked mode uh, at times. Like, it would get down to, yeah. you know, like when you when you load a YouTube video on, <laughs> on cellular <laughs> connection. So, um, 
So we we you know we've seen that the Switch is ready. It's prime for an upgrade. Yeah. And I think that a lot of new games were that we haven't seen much of might be because they require better hardware to show it away in the way Nintendo would want. Like where the hell's Metroid Prime Four? You know where's Bayonetta Three? Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine those are games that will take full advantage of of a updated Switch. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've heard like 720p OLED for the screen. We've heard 4K upscaling in docked mode using DLSS or something like that. I firmly believe all those things to be true. Um, I don't think we're there's any way we're getting native 4K out of a device the size of the Switch. Um, and I don't think Nintendo's going to go the route of like an external GPU in the dock. I think that that's just a bridge too far. One, for a company that is very technologically conservative. And two, from a price perspective, like mm -hmm. putting a whole GPU in a dock is going to be, would drive that dock up to close to 200 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, Nintendo already charges 85 for the one that they have out now. So mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think I think we will see it. I think we'll see it holiday this year. I think that's their big hitter in, in a year that'll probably otherwise be, I don't want to say devoid of software, but lighter than other years. Right. I think that we're not going to see as much first party output from Nintendo in the back half of 2021 as we normally would in another year. Um, and I think they'll make up for that by with a new hardware launch. Okay. Um, Xbox Series X slash X, well, S, X, XS, X, yeah, XS. <laughs> God, that name convention. It, it really is confounding. <sighs> Uh, in PlayStation Five, so we're what six months into the yeah. this, this console, this new generation. Um, how are you feeling about them? Do you feel like they could have waited a year? It, it's tough for me. I feel like the Xbox absolutely could have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm 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 actually in month seven with these consoles because I was mm -hmm. fortunate enough to get them early, um, and so I feel like. Uh, I have not had a compelling reason to own a Series X yet. Um, mm -hmm. Microsoft has done a great job with making old games feel better on the Series X, but they don't have like that exclusive game that they really need. Yeah. Uh, you know, Halo Infinite getting delayed really hurt uh, the Series X, and I feel like Microsoft hasn't announced anything major in its place. So I mm -hmm. feel like the Series X could have launched later. Um, I think the issue they have is that from a horsepower perspective it is not different enough from the playstation 5 to merit a delay um because people would have said oh it's the same tech in the ps5 but came out a year later what <laughs> um, <laughs> but microsoft does have some things sorted out far better um for instance their implementation of hdmi cec on the xbox is infinitely better than what sony has done uh, mm -hmm. you get a lot of granularity of control one thing that annoys me the most is that when i turn on my tv if my ps5 was the last thing i played my ps5 turns on i don't want that ever i don't know anybody that does want that mm -hmm. <laughs> um, with the xbox i can tell it you know hey only turn on when i tell you to turn on only you know or don't turn off the tv when i turn the xbox off and sony has added half weight like half measures to yeah. try to fix that but it's not all the way there yet um i would say overall it, um quick resume and uh smart delivery are excellent they work yes. every time as advertised those are things that the ps5 needs so i would say the firmware side microsoft wins hands down they have clearly put a lot of thought into the os and how it functions um but i would say on the so the ps5 still feels like something that is out at the right time. Uh, Miles Morales was very impressive. It, it did a great job extolling the benefits of the SSD and the PS5. Mm -hmm. uh, Astro Boy or Astro Bot did a great job of showing why the uh, DualSense is a cool new controller. Uh, the haptics, the adaptive triggers, all of that work ex insanely well in that game. Mm -hmm. um, and then they've done a good job with, with third party games. We've got Returnal coming up, which I'm hopeful will be really good. Uh, Final Fantasy VII Integrate is coming, which mm -hmm. I think is also going to be a great showcase for the system. Uh, I, I feel like the PS5 has earned its spot in my living room for now, yeah. um, but they definitely need to sort out the storage situation. I need to be able to <laughs> increase the storage in this thing. It is it is getting unfunny at this point. <laughs> it really is. Like I feel like 
if I have more than four games on it, like I need to immediately down, like delete something, or or thankfully with an update you can move it to a SSD externally, but or ex- external hard drive rather. But yeah, it's it's really really becoming stressful. I'm at a point now where I'm like, okay. How much do I really want to play this game or keep this on my hard drive? Oh, yeah. I mean, I got sent over a copy of NBA 2K21, mm-hmm. and I was like, 108 gigs? Mm, no thanks. I, yeah. I don't have room for you. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to have to uh, wait on that. And I, It's funny, you know, I get a review game in, and the first thing I do before I enter the code is I go check my storage. I'm like, do I have <laughs> yep. space for this? Is, am I going to be okay? And I'm... You know, we're both technical people. It's not that hard to install a new SSD in this thing, but it won't recognize it. So yeah. I'm, I'm just waiting for Sony to send over the approved list of SSDs. I will go out and buy one immediately. Um, I just, man, just point me in the direction of it, please, <laughs> please. Um, but I would say that, that, yeah, I would probably, I probably would have launched the Xbox alongside Halo. And I think the PS5 was, was, at the right point at the right time just with miles morales and and the games that they launched with i feel like they were a good showcase i mean that being said we we are kind of entering a lull i hope returnal helps reinvigorate Mm. my interest in the ps5 a bit but um after returnal i don't know what's coming next for either machine i i don't know what first party i mean we're still waiting on halo infinite on the xbox side i don't know what sony has up their sleeve after this so i mean they we probably are due for a state of play or Mm-hmm. the xbox equivalent thereof which i can never remember the name of <laughs> um just to kind of fill us in on what their plans are microsoft really needs to let us know it needs to show us the value proposition for the series x and yeah. quick yeah mine's literally is kind of like a paperweight it sits here the only time i really power it on is if i get a review code for something like uh i think i've gotten was it last year? I got uh, Call of Duty for it. I got Assassin's Creed, Watch Dogs. Ugh, God, Watch Dogs. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, but aside from like that, an occasional time I'll play some games on, um, you know, their backwards compatibility. I'm mainly between the Switch and PlayStation Five. Like, I there's nothing that's compelling me. To play the yep. Xbox Series X, so it's I had the same problem with the Xbox One. I mean, when it started out, I was like, "Oh, cool!" You know, I got Dead Rising Three, I got Rise on Rome, even though people hate that. <laughs> I had a <laughs> bunch of different games, but then it's like Microsoft just stopped caring about exclusives, you know. And it's like, yeah, oh, okay, I, I can understand that. It feels like they're they're not as much about exclusives as they are about getting games onto game pass now which yeah. i mean that's cool mlb the show is on game pass which is a weird thing to see but yeah i would i would still like to see some first party content come out in yeah. fast especially with all the ips that they own that they're not like come on rare like yeah where's <laughs> where's conquer where's banjo where's where's a lot of these characters man i yeah. i would love to see rare do some more traditional content that we expect from them from the n64 days but i don't know what's going on there yeah um winding down to the last couple questions is you know being completely respectful of your time um what are some games that or you know that you're playing on your own time because you're not you know playing due to review you know obligations yeah yeah (laughs) the ones i can talk about um (laughs) So I am currently playing, uh, well, I finished just recently. I picked up a Record of Lotus War, Deedlet and Wonder Labyrinth for PC. Oh, it's so good. And it's so good. So it good. is ridiculous. <laughs> like, it was, again, uh, we talked about this earlier in the episode. I bought that game, and I liked it so much I reviewed it. Because I was mm. just like, this game's good, and I'm spending a lot of time with it. Um, I ended up liking that so much that I picked up the... Uh, first game that that team did uh, team ladybug also released a uh, toho luna knights which nice. is another yep. symphony of the night style game yep. it's on the switch it's, yep. it's perfect i love that game too probably not going to review it because i'm a lot <laughs> i'm very busy with a lot of other things right now mm-hmm. um and then uh i'm really looking forward to it i'm not playing it yet i don't have access to it yet 
Um, but I've been informed by Sega, and I'm allowed to talk about this one, that I will be uh, I will be given access to the PSO2 New Genesis uh, closed beta, which is happening oh, on May 14th. Man. Oh, man. So I am all over that. I'm a huge, huge, huge Sega fan. I grew up with a Master System in my house growing up, and so Fantasy Star has been a staple in my gaming life. So any new Fantasy Star game, I'm always going to be there day one, or in this case, I guess, day zero. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so since you brought up Fantasy Star Wars, um, if we go back to the Genesis days and Sega Master System days, uh, between, actually, I could say Fantasy Star 1 through 4. I'm going to say this, Fantasy Star 2 or Fantasy Star 4, which would you say is better? Oh, man, I got to go with uh, Fantasy Star 4, just because okay. uh, I feel like that one went a lot of weird places, like... Mm-hmm. Uh, you had Seth join your party, and then it turned out that Seth was Dark Falls, and you had to find <laughs> him like on the beach. And then you find out that all throughout this whole series, Dark Falls has really just been puppeteered by the uh, oh god, what's it called? Oh, it's um, not the um, Infinite um, Darkness. It's the Profound Darkness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Profound Darkness has really been the puppet master behind all four games, and you fight this godlike being and so i i love that game it is it is an all-time great in my opinion but is fantasy it? star 2 is excellent and the and the nade death scene like when yeah. people when people were freaking out about eris i'm like i've been here i've done that <laughs> right <laughs> oh man it's it, i would if they remade 2 Oh my god! Oh, that would be so good, especially because one got a remake on the PS2, like a full-on yeah. visual remake. I'm like, you gotta do that for all the games. They they need they still need to release the the PS2 Sega Ages version of P- uh, Fantasy Star One out here. Like, I I still yeah. want that. Yeah, it, it's crazy when you look at um, you know, if we were to look at companies that can rival Nintendo, like t- still to this day, Sega still can't. There's so yeah. many IPs they just sit on, like you know, Se- I. Skies of Arcadia. Where's my new one? <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, well they they let other people make uh, a new Wonder Boy, a new Alex Kidd, a new Streets right. of Rage, a new Shenmue. Uh, you know, I'm I'm surprised by the amount of IPs that Sega has in their back catalog that they've just kind of forgotten. Yeah. And then Sonic is, yeah. Well. Sonic is not what he used to be. <laughs> no, no, he's not. <laughs> Um, uh, oh God. Sega, what are you doing? What are you doing with your <laughs> life? Uh, you remember that? You remember a couple of years ago the whole Dreamcast 2 rumors? Oh my God. <laughs> you know, the one that crops up every couple of years? I mean, yeah. essentially, the Xbox, the original Xbox, was the Dreamcast 2. I mean, a lot of the same key folks were there. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the software under the hood was very similar to the Dreamcast. Uh, I don't know. I would love a Dreamcast too, but Sega's Sega's not going to do it. No. It seems like right now with Sega, the main priority for them is either Yakuza titles or you know, since they acquired uh, Atlas, Persona. So Yep. It, it, they've got their, <sighs> their key franchises now, and that's pretty much all they do, which is unfortunate we- because there's a lot of gold to be mined from their back catalog. There really is. Like, I, I'm so, so, you know, the, what was it, uh, SMT3, uh, HD remaster. People yeah. People putting out the previews today. And I'm, I have so many feelings on this. Um, <laughs> I like the Megami Tensei franchise. Yeah. All of it. Um, I understand Persona has become kind of like the the marquee of that franchise. And it's what has me nervous because people who only play Persona and specifically Persona 5 and 4 have never touched Persona 2 Theology, which Instant Sin, Eternal Punishment, if you haven't played them, play them. Um, Mm -hmm. You can actually still get them on the PlayStation store (laughs) since they're not. They're not going anywhere. But anyway, um, I'm people who there's a lot of people who are going to pick up the SMT three remaster and possibly even pick up SMT five and expect Persona and not realize they're going to be playing a game that's going to force you to learn it 
Yep. And will kick <laughs> your balls in, <laughs> walk all over you, and laugh at you while it's doing it. Um, and and I think it's going to be very polarizing because I've saw, you know, several preview videos come up, and I assume it's a lot of, you know, a, a lot of younger uh, games journalists that are s- pretty much knocking it like SMT3 remaster because it's so difficult. And they're like, oh, it's, it's not a lot of modern, impro- you know, additions to it aside from like a, a was it the merciful difficulty, which makes it a lot more easy and you won't die as much. But I'm like, the whole core concept of SMT is how difficult it is. Like that's yeah, it's, it's, it's the Dark Souls of RPG JRPGs. Uh, God, I actually use that reference. Oh. <laughs> 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 I I get it. I think that you know I'm one. I'm all for more options. I think more right. options are never a bad thing. I think that it's okay to to reduce difficulty and do stuff like that in games. But also, I think you should understand going into a game like what the history of that game is. What the you know if, if you're going to take a critical look, right? If you're if you're mm-hmm. buying it, you don't need to know the history. You don't need to know anything really. Right. As, as long as it interests you, buy what you want to buy. But mm-hmm. if you're going to publish a review or a video or an editorial on a game you should probably take a minute to sit back and and learn what the culture around that game is like what what draws people in uh so that you can inform people again we we talked about playing games that aren't for you you know reviewing games that aren't for you and that's totally fine to say like hey i played smt3 remake i didn't like it but here's what it's about you know and Mm -hmm. if, if you like these things i'm describing then it's probably for you. I just don't like them. And I think that that's a great way to approach something like that. I also think that when I approach a review, I try Mm -hmm. to find out what the developer's recommended difficulty is. And Mm -hmm. I try to play it there. And I will always, you know, I've definitely had games where I've played it at the recommended difficulty and been like, God damn, this is too hard. (laughs) You know, I, I can't do this. But I will say, like, I played it on what they told me to play it on. And I personally felt that it was too difficult and I turned it down and I had a much better time once I turned it down or I thought it was too easy once I turned it down. And I think they could tweak the difficulty. But if you like hard games, because there's definitely a huge subset of people that enjoy very difficult games, then Mm -hmm. you'll probably find a lot to love here. It's just not my thing. Like, I'm not a Dark Souls person. Um, I'm probably not an SMT person. I've Mm -hmm. played SMT4 on the 3DS or the DS. Oh, that was brutal. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it, it was. It was, and I was like, you know what? I'm not reviewing this, so I gotta, I, I gotta go. <laughs> so yeah, I was like, I'm out of here. But I, I respect that there are people out there that they thrive on that challenge. I'm just not one of them. Yeah. Um, wind down to the last two questions. Uh, what are some of your hobbies that people may not know about? Oh man. So, well, y'all are gonna find out a lot more about it tomorrow on TNT. But I'm a huge anime fan, like gigantic, Ooh. ridiculous, like thousand percent weeb. <laughs> over here Ooh. um and in fact the new dragon ball super chapter just dropped today and i was i've probably read it four times already um <laughs> i i translate so i i speak four languages i speak german spanish and japanese in addition to english wow. i've translated several games and and you know done done a lot with that i i uh i'm, I'm not by no means a professional or fluent but i i get by mm-hmm. um i also just enjoy like I enjoy watching other people's content. Like I am never not watching someone else's videos. I think that as someone who makes videos, I can learn mm-hmm. a lot from watching other people's styles, other people's presentation styles, other people's uh, directorial styles in a sense, like when, when they use transitions, when they use jump cuts, you know, there's so much you can learn if you take a critical eye to videos from people you enjoy watching. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm always trying to incorporate that stuff. So I end up watching <laughs> an absurd number of YouTube videos a day, but um, yeah, I would say you know anime, manga, uh, and and learning more about our craft, like like you know just how to use stuff. I'm always on forums about how to improve my render times, my render speeds. I build computers, um, I build mechanical keyboards now because the nice. pandemic has just left me with more time than I expected. <laughs> um, so I ended up like the keyboard I'm using right now is something I built, and I'm very proud of the fact that i somehow made something that hasn't shocked me to death yet 
So, so um, are you into Attack on Titan? And if so, what did you think of uh, Chapter 139? So I am into it, and I'm working on a secret project right now. So I haven't seen Chapter 139 yet. Um, but we're going to have stuff. something going up on the channel related <laughs> to Attack on Titan soon. Okay, okay. Yeah, that one's very divisive. Um, yeah, that was the last thing I'll say about that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, are you, like, when it comes to manga, are you more into, like, uh, Isekai or, you know, um, what, what, what? More of, like, a shonen seinen person when okay. it comes to manga. Like, I, I read a, a wide variety of manga. Some of my favorites, Dragon Ball, obviously, since I mm -hmm. just mentioned that. Uh, Hajime no Ippo is one of my one of my favorites. Like he's Excellent. been in retirement for two actual real world years now, and <laughs> I'm just like, please come back, please fight again. Um, I I really enjoy. Uh, I've I've been reading Boruto again lately. Ever since uh, Masashi Kishimoto took back over, mm -hmm. um, I think it's starting to trend upward. Um, I really want to get into One Piece, but I, the character designs haven't done it for me yet. Yeah, same for me. I have me. a hard time getting around that. Yeah. Um, other than that, I probably... Man, those are probably my core series that I follow, like, week to week. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's... Well, month to month in the case of Super. But I, uh, I'm i always looking for, like, a new one to start reading. And that that's mm -hmm. very, very... Uh, difficult for me because i feel like i don't have enough time to do the stuff i want to do already <laughs> and then i'm like oh i'll just start a new manga series and read through the whole thing <laughs> but i am also reading uh i happen to have it with me i'm trying to get through ask a Wada. uh Ooh. oh frames cut off so i picked that up and uh i also have jason schreier's new book which i'm reading uh that is uh press reset which i have somewhere off in the distance over there <laughs> oh, i was trying to do the uh, i didn't do it right i was like oh let me I think oh, I do nice. it this way. Can I do? Can I just grab and pull? There we go. Boom. Ooh, I just learned look at something that. new. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, my room's a mess, but I, I back on that shelf where the arcade machines are. I have uh, I have Jason Schreier's latest book, which I'm still working my way through. It's very, very good though. Nice, nice, nice. And we will have him on the channel in a few weeks. So Ooh, awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, I was gonna definitely say for manga, definitely check out claymore and berserk Ooh, the only I've thing about berserk claymore. the only thing about berserk and i'm st i've been following that for 20 plus years i was gonna say he was on the boat for a decade man <laughs> I, I remember the boat yes. miura please finish it at this point i heard last i someone said um or i think someone said miura hinted that the story is only like 40 or 50 something percent complete wow and i'm like i can't go another two decades <laughs> no <laughs> who anyways um yeah i i think oh dude you should definitely i, I should connect you and my wife because she's so the she does a lot of anime manga content and she's always she reads everything and she covers oh, wow. everything, and so, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll connect you guys. Um, yeah, for sure. My but, Hero Academia is the last one I'll mention. I'm I'm caught up on the manga, and oh, it's getting good. It it's is getting real good. There's so many of my friends are the main cast of that show, and it's just super surreal. <laughs> God. Um. Okay. So, final question. Um. Is there anything? in the works that you would like or you can you know i understand embargoes and everything and secret projects anything you would like to share the audience before we go sure um so we are in the middle of uh so so may marks six months mm -hmm. since we started gvg we're at six months uh just under sixty six thousand subs and mm -hmm. we have a lot planned uh we are going to be uh, starting season two of today's news tonight on uh, May 3rd. And okay. with that, the show will actually become free for all. So no more, no more paywalling, no more uh, having to sign up to the Patreon to watch it. It'll be available on every podcast service. Uh, you know, as Greg Miller would say around the globe, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> starting May 1st uh, with our whole backlog available too. 
And so you'll be able to join us live to uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday night, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Come one, come all. We will be glad to have you there. Uh, that is probably the biggest thing happening. But if you want more details about what we're doing um, after May 1st, head over to patreon.com slash gvgaming, and we'll have the whole spread for you. We've got a couple new shows we're announcing, um, a few other things in a, uh, a new podcast, um, and a new weekly series that I can't mm-hmm. wait for you guys to find out more about. Awesome, awesome. And I lied. I actually have one final question for you. Oh, sure. Did you have fun? Oh, man, of course. Come on. (laughs) Come on. That's the easiest one you've thrown at me all day. Yeah, it's always (laughs) a pleasure to hang out with you, man. Uh, We we definitely need to get you back on the show at some point. Uh, Yeah. Once the the paywall has lifted, then we should have you on to a much larger audience, hopefully, right? (laughs) Like, hopefully more people show up. Yeah. but yeah, I'm, I'm definitely excited. We'd, we'd love to have you on again uh, and uh, love to find out more about what you've been up to on, on your end once we can talk about all these embargoed things we're both working on. Right. Definitely. Definitely. Hey, man, uh, whenever you guys would like me on, just let me know. Um, and I would love to definitely have you back on the show. It's been an absolute blast. Uh, tell people where they can find you again, and I will be leaving links to everything in the description below. As oh, well. <laughs> nice. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, it's been it's been an absolute pleasure, and I'd love to come on anytime you're willing to have me. Um, you can find us over at good-vibes-gaming.com. That'll take you straight to our YouTube channel. We don't have one of those fancy IDs yet because we're not that cool. Um, you can also find us at <laughs> twitter.com slash gvgofficial, or you can find uh, me specifically at twitter.com slash stevembowling. Uh, but those are all our links. Uh, also, patreon.com slash gvgaming, as I mentioned, if you feel like supporting us on Patreon. But I definitely recommend you check out the channel first. Find out if we're worth it. We are. But <laughs> watch some definitely, of our stuff. Definitely. Definitely. And uh, with that being said, thank you, Steve, for coming on the show. It's been an absolute honor and privilege having you on. So much I've learned from you today. I've enjoyed this conversation. We're definitely going to do this again. I'm definitely going to have you back on the show. Links to all of Steve's social media as well as uh gvgs as well will be in the description below please go and sub to your channel follow them on social media and if you feel like it support them on patreon phenomenal content highly recommended and uh yeah with that being said we're signing out if you want to catch this episode of the podcast along with many others we're on every major podcast ah i can't talk <laughs> that's that ha huh, when you have kids people for those of you who don't yeah. have kids yeah, uh, it happens. You'll be talking and then like, blah. anyway, anyway, <laughs> on every major podcasting outlet. And um, with that being said, we're signing out. You guys have a blessed one. Hey, bye, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. I hope it was informative, engaging, and you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure you go ahead and leave a rating and a review. It greatly helps out the podcast and helps the platforms that we're on. Go ahead and promote us more so that more people can check it out. And if you're wondering what all platforms we're on, aside from what you've listened to it on, we're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Pandora, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. And if you want to support the podcast, then we've got Patreon, so patreon.com slash Mikel Casanova, which allows us to continue doing what we're doing. If you're looking for this in video format, we're also available on twitch.tv slash Mikhail Casanova as well as youtube.com slash Mikhail Casanova. So with all that being said, I'll catch you on the next episode of Hawaii's number one podcast and the number one podcast in the Pacific, the Casanova Podcast. You have a great day and I'll see you on the next one.